everyone. Uh, my name is Flora Gebali. I'm 27 and I'm a social entrepreneur. Uh, I also wrote my first book uh, named Ma Génération va changer le monde. My generation uh, will change the world. Uh, and I created my own company named Coalition uh, to help to help other companies uh, uh, with a transformation, uh, social and ecological uh, transformation and social and ecological uh, issues. Uh, when uh, I uh, discover a new company, a new industry, uh, I always uh, discover something is that uh, people we meet uh, are uh, really conscious. Uh, they have a deep and strong uh, ecological and social uh, consciousness. Uh, and they have uh, another skills is um, uh, a kind of leadership that helps them uh, uh, changing things and uh, changing things uh, from within. Uh, that's why I wanted you to meet uh, Quentin uh, right here. Hi Quentin. Uh, Quentin, you're 30 and uh, three years ago you uh, experienced um, uh, ecological depression, as you call it. Uh, so you're working at uh, BCG, Boston uh, Consulting yes. Group, uh, and you decided to react, to act. You did not uh, choose to quit your job uh, and go uh, live in the countryside, uh, becoming a farmer or whatever, uh, but stay uh, in the company and uh, change things from within. So maybe uh, you can... Uh, uh, tell uh, us more about it. Uh, yeah. uh, I leave you the floor. With a great pleasure. Um, how or can I change, can I have an impact on the world and can I change my employer? This is a question that, and this is the question today, uh, is the question of our own personal impact facing these great challenges like the ecological and social challenges we have ahead. And uh, indeed, three years ago, um, I decided that we'll, uh, I will try to engage at my own company at the workplace to try to have an impact. And so today I'd like to tell about this story. But actually this story is also the one of thousands of other persons. Um, it's the story of uh, Eva in an electricity company. It's the story of Alexi in a tire manufacturer. It's the story of Emmanuel in a professional textile company. It's the story of Marion in a luxury company or Pauline in an environmental service company. <laughs> At the end, I will stop here because it's the story of thousands of employees who decided that they wanted to have an impact at their, uh, at their own level. And so what did they decide to do? They decided to, they decided to create what we call employee collectives. Employee collectives are, it defines when groups of people within a company decide that besides their normal job, they will try to have concrete actions and concrete impact at their workplace. And in the last months, we realized that these employee collectives were dozens and hundreds. And it was a great thing to discover that this thing that I had initiated in my own company, some other had done, had done that. And so we decided to unite our force uh, and at least to connect and to see what we could do together. So we created a network, uh, which we call Le Collectif, which aims at unlocking the potential of all these employees who have this desire to act within their companies. First, so what are employee collectives doing? Um, employee collectives have action on um, three main topics. First, they're trying to change the practices uh, in their company. They're trying to change, I mean, it can be as simple as trying to change the canteen or during mobility reduction plan, for instance. Second, they try to raise awareness and uh, higher and increase the level of expertise and knowledge within their company. And third, they really desire and they, they do some propositions and they try to act to participate to the change of the, of, the, of the business models of their company, of the products and the services that their employers are doing. And so we realized that with the 30 collectives that we connected with in the last months, it was already 150 actions that were, that were done on these three topics. But more than that, what we saw is that we were sharing a common mode of action within company, which is in three words. It's positive, constructive action. The way these people decide to, to engage in their company is first by really concrete action. It's, it's not can company change, it's what can I do with the people around me, really concrete, that could try to have an impact. The second thing is positive. We all see that it's very, it's, a, it's an incredible feeling if you try to act and you saw the impact of what you're doing and if you connect with some other of your colleagues to try to change your company from within. It's really positive and this is the way we see the social and ecological transition. The third is constructive. We 
tend uh, in our action to engage the other employees, we tend to engage the management, and it's really important uh, to have this feeling and this ambition of togetherness and try to embark the other and not trying to oppose people. So this is the mode of action that the, the employee collectives have been, uh, have been, have been having. Uh, the last thing is the why. Why do employees at the end, uh, I mean, when we, when we exchange uh, from, uh, it was like a couple of months ago, um, we, we realized that we had common value, that the why behind our actions were, were quite common. And actually, the employees who engage their company are in a double quest. The first quest that they have is, the, is to align their personal convictions with their, with their jobs, with what happens at work, and with the products and the services of the companies they are working for. So there is a quest of alignment, which is really deep. It's, it's like it's intimate. And the second quest that they are is that it's more collective. It's how together we succeed in the social and environmental challenges ahead, which are really tough. And this quest has expressed itself through employee collective and concrete action. So it was an incredible feeling to meet within a company and with other companies, but we have the feeling that this can just be a beginning. Uh, we have the feeling that um, we may have to, to scale that. If we take a step back today, um, 100% of companies will have to transform themselves. I mean, circular economy, I mean, this fair condi working condition in the company supply chain, responsible products, the, the steps and the challenges ahead are really huge. And all companies and all organizations will have to transform themselves whatsoever. On the other hand, we see that 80% of employees desire to engage at work. And that most of them in companies don't feel that engaged in the current situation. And we have the feeling that in our collectives, we have we had a native engagement. We have, when people do, do this action that they are doing at work, when they connect with some other people, it really, it really demultiplies the, the motivation that they have and it demultiplies the impact. And so we created this network that we call Les Collectifs to go to another scale. Uh, because we think of collectives, at the end we think of collectives of internal sustainability in the incubators within companies. And what we want to propose with you today is, uh, I mean, what if this experience was put at scale? With the 30 collectives from 30 different companies and in various industries that we connected in the last, in the last months, we, we gathered and we directly involved more than 4,500 people and touched many much more within our companies. There are 6,000 companies of more than 250 people just in France. What if in each of these companies, the energy and the desires of the employees was activated. And this is why we created the network, Les Collectifs, and this is, why we want to, that is what we want to do with you. Each collective has often started with a really simple step, trying to do um, today, I mean, trying to do something today. Uh, and our ambition, with, uh, our ambition with the network is, is to make companies um, embark in this fantastic transformation, which is the transformation of their, of their culture and of their, their business models. Um, so if you're an employee in a company and you have this desire to act, just do it. Try to f do this little action that maybe you have in mind, which can be trying to connect with some other people or can be a simple action at the workplace. Try to do with that and then see what happens. Because what we saw in our collectives is when you start small and you try to scale it, then you have a growing impact. And with the network, we'll be here to help. The other people we want to talk to are the, the leaders in companies. And um, if you're a leader, at the end, you have already in your company an extraordinary force with the people who are highly aware and highly engaged. You have these internal incubators. So identify who are these people, do you have a collective, and try to give them more support, try to hear them, try to co-build with them. We, we, have great, um, we have great examples of when management works with the employee collectives to co-build on the sustainability strategy. And really, it's, it's magic. Um, so do so, give support, and uh, help them go to another scale. And I'll finish saying that for us, employees engaged in collectives, uh, this has, been, this has been a fantastic experience. I mean, we, some started a couple of years ago. Uh, we could connect within companies with people we would have never connected with from all services, from different offices, from 
different countries. And this is, we had a tough year, uh, and we have tough years ahead, but we are gathered in the fact that we want to tackle it and to see it as really as an adventure. And we don't know what, to, what tomorrow will be made of, but really this engagement really daily uh, and ambitious within our companies really gave us purpose and it gave us a fantastic energy. So we can just encourage you to join us or to act at your level because it pays off. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Quentin. Uh, I'll only wa have one uh, question, a quick question for you. Uh, you're 30, you work in a very competitive uh, company. Uh, maybe we have uh, other empl employees uh, watching us and asking th themselves uh, ca what can they do. Uh, so my question is, uh, is it personally interesting for you in a big uh, uh, competitive company to, um, uh, to uh, create uh, uh, entrepreneur programs like you do? Uh, and is it like uh, for your career uh, um, a good uh, a way of doing things? Um, so first, uh, thanks for the question. Um, it, it really changes the experience at the workplace. If you engage with uh, some people, you create a network at the workplace and just like this kind of meeting yeah, and your daily people, life changes. your daily life changes. And the purpose, uh, and when you see the impacts of what you're doing with other employees uh, getting bigger in your company, this gives, this, this gives purpose and this gives like a, a great, great feeling. We have examples of people uh, who have started with some actions and then it, it was a bigger, uh, I mean myself, I didn't work in sustainability uh, when, when I was starting my employee collective. Uh, correlation is not causality. Now it's, I'm, I have the chance to, uh, to be able to do, to do that. Uh, and we have similar experience in, uh, in Les Collectifs, but not all of them. Uh, but what we see is that engaging at your level uh, makes that you try things, you connect with some people, and you gain experience in that, that topics. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then, then you, are in a, you, are in a, uh, you are a resource, or you have a force for your employer. And we have many cases of people in their employee collectives who have this co building relationship with the management. And sometimes it's changing their career, sometimes not. But this is the, I mean, what we want with Les Collectifs is to increase the involvement of such aware employees in the building of the sustainability strategy of their companies. Okay, thank you so much, Quentin, you for Paul. your testimony. So now uh, I am pleased to introduce uh, Tatiana, who will uh, moderate uh, the next uh, session. Tatiana is a business consultant specialist for innovation uh, enhancements. Uh, so maybe, uh, hi, Tatiana, can I give the floor? Good afternoon. Thank you, Flora, for the introduction. The aim of our session is to share information how changing people, aspiration, and professional background uh, can affect the transformation in organization. So I will present our speakers who are experts in this field. With us today is uh, Francois Bonissi. Francois is director of uh, Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship. Next to Francois is uh, Saskia Breisten. Uh, Saskia is co-founder and CEO of uh, Jan's, uh, Yunus uh, Social Business. And uh, with us is uh, Gisela San Sanchez. Uh, Gisela is director of uh, corporate affairs at Florida Ice and Farm Company. Uh, welcome and uh, uh, thank you for being with us today. To get us started and uh, have a mutual understanding, uh, Saskia, could you tell us what do you mean when you say social entrepreneur? Of course, and thanks so much for the introduction. Um, so basically, when we talk about corporate social entrepreneurs, um, we're actually talking about intrapreneurs, so employees within large corporations that have decided to solve a social or environmental problem through building a business unit or even a separate spin-off business um, that uses the core competences of the company 
to solve that particular social or environmental problem. So my favorite example that I always use is um, a joint venture that we created over a decade ago with Danone. Um, it is a separate business unit that has been spun off from Danone, but is still owned by Danone, um, the yogurt company, and um, it uh, sells yogurt that's enriched with micronutrients and vitamins to combat malnutrition. So that's a social problem that this company um, is solving. Um, and does that in a business way um, and all profits get recycled. So that's that's basically an example of a corporate social business that has been started by a corporate, a corporate social entrepreneur to explain um, where we're coming from. Thank you, Saskia. It is really important to, to underline this difference between entrepreneur and entrepreneur. So, uh, moving to Francois. Francois uh, Klaus Schwab is actually well-known foundations and uh, foundation and calls business leaders uh, to reimagine our world and specifically our economy uh, in order to bring new direction in this post-COVID time. From your point of view, what role the social entrepreneur play in that? Thank you so much, and uh, delighted to be here and. Together with uh, Saskia and uh, Gisela, so just lovely to to see everyone and and, and be at this conference today. Uh, indeed, uh, the companies today are, are facing significant questions about their role in the world. And uh, Professor Schwab and uh, our chairperson Hilda Schwab have been really proponents of the idea of stakeholder capitalism, uh, and this is. While it's been around for more than 50 years as a concept, has only become more recently accepted as the dominant philosophy around how companies should operate in the world. They're beyond just a corporate responsibility, actually they have a whole set of responsibilities, but also business themselves are an important stakeholder. And as now leaders of business ask their themselves the question around, well, what is our purpose as a company and society? What is our purpose in sustaining the planet? And who is going to do that for us? The big question then becomes the how and the who. And so we, uh, together with our, our partners like Unisocial Business and together with uh, pointing and shining the light on amazing entrepreneurs like uh, Gisela, who's with us today, truly believe that so much of that change needs to come from within a company. Uh, and that's really the role that entrepreneurs can play. Uh, while many people outside the company can, can give perspectives around what a company should do, it really requires people inside the company to, to be that change, to, 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 to drive both initiatives like uh, uh, Saskia demonstrated with an example that can prove a case, that can prove a point that it is possible for companies to have purpose and be financially sustainable and successful and also we know the next generation of young people uh, also want this out of companies. So there are so many reasons why companies need to do this. The question is how and who, and we really want to focus on why entrepreneurs, while they have many similarities with entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs, are a really important uh, a tribe of people around the world that we need to support and shine Thank you. Thank you, uh, Francois. Uh, moving uh, coming back to Saskia. Uh, Saskia, you have been working with and researching uh, social entrepreneurs in a large corporation for uh, many years. So what do you feel has changed the most over the last year? What kind of impact has COVID uh, had on the work of the entrepreneurs? Um, yeah, indeed, we, we have actually been working um, in this field of social business for over a decade now and over the last uh, many years have uh, been working with large corporations, but of course also with local entrepreneurs at UNO Social Business. Um, so if I look at how things have changed over the last decade, when I actually started in this field a decade ago, I would go and tell people that, you know, we set up social businesses um, together with corporations or together with local entrepreneurs and people were like, social what? They didn't really understand that you could have a social problem that you solve, but you do it in a business way. They were either thinking like, oh, that's charity or CSR, or they were thinking, oh, that's normal business and let's have very high returns. So that idea of actually creating a type of business 
um, that would solve a problem and be financially self-sustainable and profitable was something that's very foreign about 10 years ago. Now I feel, um, similar to what um, Francois has just been saying, the dominant narrative is changing. So we're not only talking about shareholder value maximization, but we're now talking more and more about how business can also do good to society. And within that whole spectrum, there is like a big spectrum from everything like, uh, you know, super extreme like social business where everything gets reinvested um, all the way through to, well, a little bit of ESG, which um, environmental, social and governments, which is a, is a term for ensuring that corporations don't do as much harm as they did before. So in other words, I mm -hmm. see a very positive trend within these last 10 years, just in general, in the whole topic of what the role for business is in society. Now, if we jump specifically into the whole topic of corporate social entrepreneurship, um, I also see a positive trend um, for one reason that corporations have now for the last two, three years in particularly started being under pressure from a number of different uh, sides. On the one hand, by grassroots movements like the Fridays for Futures or the Black Lives Matter, um, consumer groups are pushing more and more for transparency in the value chain. Employees don't want to work for big old corporations that just make profit. And also even investors like the big black rocks of this world in brackets, and they're not perfect at all, um, are also pushing for more environmental and social responsibility. So these companies are now being pushed. So they're making commitments and saying, oh, we're going to be net zero X, Y, Z until some, some year, or we're going to have so and so much social impact. But the issue is they often don't really know where to start and how to get things done concretely. And that's where we believe that the solutions to those problems actually often lie within the company. And that's where sort of corporate social entrepreneurs, so employees within the companies, often know how they could employ the resources of these global corporations to really solve social problems. Um, and um, in, if I'm now looking at particularly the COVID crisis, I think that, let's say I'm optimistic here that this um, has accelerated um, the drive for corporations to at least attack the environmental topic. And slowly but surely, I also see that companies are slowly but surely understanding that also the inequality topic and the racial inequality, economic inequality has to also be um, attacked by corporates and that corporate social entrepreneurship is one tool and one pathway how they can get there. Thank you, Saskia. Mentioning that uh, uh, many of the corporation and uh, smaller entrepreneurs, uh, they have a company in general, they often have a nice title with uh, those goals, but actually uh, they don't know how to start uh, in uh, implementation terms. Uh, what would be your, let's say, one, two, three suggestion, meaning uh, first steps uh, to, to, to be undertaken? In, in real uh, in in real direction uh, with the concrete impacts. Um, well, first of all, I think um, uh, find out a good balance between what are the problems in the world and what are my core competences as a company. We often at Uno Social Business kind of offer what we call spark shops, so kind of workshops where we bring those two worlds together, the problems in the world and the core competences of the business. And that's where great ideas can come up. That can come through like a creative workshop that can come through, you know, uh, people in the company and, and applying for and like an ideas uh, um, competition. And that's where you relatively quickly can find uh, an idea what you could do. I'm just thinking, for example, about a company like AXA, uh, a big insurance company. It was pretty easy to say, well, they currently sell insurance to the middle class around the world. Those people are covered. They realized so and so many million people in the world, I don't know the exact number, don't actually have the access to insurance, but they need it because those are often the ones that are the most vulnerable to um, shocks, like let's say environmental shocks, for example. Mm -hmm. So AXA started with their emerging customers uh, business, uh, which, which a lovely corporate social entrepreneur that we know, Garance uh, uh, Richard Vatti, is, is leading. Um, they came up with um, an insurance solution for, let's say, um, the lower middle class in uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. 
uh, and have started coming up with specific solutions for them. So literally, I think, again, you just have to start with what are your core competences? In this case, it's insurance. What are the problems in the world? People don't have access to insurance and thereby fall into poverty more quickly. Match those two and come up with a business model. Um, and then I would say, don't, um, well, let's say, give that business some freedom to develop. Don't try and do it all within the corporate structures. Just give it some freedom to develop, like put one social entrepreneur on the driver's seat, give it some budget and let it run rather than trying to control everything in the normal corporate structures. So it needs a little bit of a separation from the normal business as well, I would say. Yes, thank you. It would mean that uh, the main advice is actually to be focused in the frame of own uh, resources and competencies. Uh, another issue uh, which uh, Saskia, you might to comment to our audience is, uh, what is the role of executives in uh, all these uh, scenarios? Because there is a tendency, as you explained, that uh, kind of uh, power uh, and weight uh, is putting down on employees, uh, meaning uh, uh, the transformation is going down to organization hierarchy. So what is the role of executives uh, or uh, top leaders or managers in this scenario? Um, well, I'll answer that, but I think we should also hear Gisela on this because, of course, she's been through this practically. She is a corporate social entrepreneur and she's created a totally awesome social business. So perhaps maybe one sentence from my side. It is, of mm -hmm. course, the best solution if you have buy-in from uh, the chief um, executive um, of the company. Um, and um, if they really push for these types of initiatives to happen, sometimes that doesn't happen right away at the start. And the corporate social entrepreneur has to do their own thing um, and just get started and try and create some success and then later on sell it internally. And sometimes it really comes top down mandated from the CEO or the board. That's, of course, the ideal solution because it um, it gives the initiative the best backing because um, these types of initiatives, corporate social businesses, they're not typically normal initiatives within a corporation. Um, that's why actually a, a, an initiative that Francois and I, so the World Economic Forum, uh, Schwab Foundation and Unisocial Business have created together is called the unusual pioneers. Because people like Gisela, they're not the typical people within corporations. They're the crazy frogs that decide, you know, despite the fact that this corporation is actually here to make profit, I'm actually going to use this corporation to do social good. So. I'll shut up at this point. I really think we should listen to Gisela because she's a practitioner um, and, and she's just, she's an awesome leader in this field. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let her tell her story. Thank you. Thank you, Saskia, for a, a nice introduction for Gisela. We will uh, have enough time to, to hear a story from uh, Gisela. Now we are eager to, to hear you, Gisela. You are also coming from a large corporation. But for start, could you please briefly introduce your career background, uh, 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 just uh, some details about that? Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you. I feel really honored. I'm an industrial engineer uh, with an MBA, uh, 25 years of experience, the majority working on sustainability, and the last 13 working for a food and beverages company that has headquarters in Costa Rica and operations in the US, Mexico, and Central America. So, but most important than that, I will say I'm a mother and a wife and, uh, and a daughter. And because of that, I always have been dreaming about being part of the solution to at least one of the, of the challenges of the world. And, um, and 10 years ago, I started thinking about what is my purpose, came across a fantastic definition of purpose, of personal purpose by uh, Frederick Buchner that says, purpose is where, or the place where the, your deepest, or your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. And in my case, uh, I kept asking the question is food, food for everyone and especially for children. So starting doing my own research, thinking uh, as an opportunity to be an entrepreneur and uh, understanding what are the, the main causes of malnutrition, what is undernutrition or hidden hunger. Uh, Two billion people suffer from hidden hunger around the world. And there is a, an opportunity called 1,000 days window. That is the most critical part when a, a boy or a baby uh, is 
created, so pregnancy and the first two years are the most important. And I realized something that was amazing for me. I always thought that education was the key to get away from poverty, but before that you need nutrition. So starting trying to do it by my own, as Saskia was saying, and uh, very quickly I realized that it was almost impossible for me to be successful and that NutriVida uh, needed a company. And because I work for a food and beverages company, there is a sweet spot with the core business. Um, we understood the social business concept. I personally chase Saskia and Professor Yunus around the world and convince them to be part of NutriVida. So we created the company seven years ago, or the social business um, with FIFCO and, uh, and actually had a really bold and ambitious a goal to eradicate undernutrition, at least in our region, which is Central America. Hopefully we can expand and starting producing fortified food uh, and sell it at cost, basically almost at cost, so the majority of the people can buy it. So now we have been able to provide food to 2.3 million people, which for me is amazing. That's the beauty of a social business. It's such a simple concept but at the same time so powerful. And we came to financial sustainability a few months ago. So we feel honored and happy to, to be part of, of, of this movement of social business and be an entrepreneur. Thank you, Gisela. It's really impressive and inspiring, if I may say, because it's really concrete uh, indicators and achievement behind your uh, uh, story and uh, your social uh, initiative. Uh, so uh, can you pick some, for our audience, uh, it's always interesting to hear some concrete exam example. Can you pick some story, some concrete uh, uh, example from a recent, uh, recent past of how your initiative came to light? Yes, actually I joined the company um, 13 years ago, the right timing because we were growing very fast. So the economic component of the company was in good shape. And, um, and I proposed that we can become a triple bottom line company and create environmental and social value at the same time, compensate our employees at least 40% based on those two uh, dimensions instead of only the economic. And, and actually NutriVida was part of that. We decided to invest 8%, uh, around 8% of net profits in social endeavors. So uh, uh, NutriVida was a natural thing to do uh, because the, the social business concept is so powerful, so simple. And we, we could invest this money instead of having to invest every year in, in different um, social uh, uh, projects like uh, with NGOs, we could create this social business and be financially sustainable. I thought in three years, but it took seven years. Uh, so that's one of the lessons learned. You have to be cautious about what you say when you promise to your board. <laughs> uh, but it has been an amazing experience. Uh, many employees of the company are involved in NutriVida, so it's, it's a FIFCO social endeavor and social business, and it's a, it's a way to, to give back and to, and to be a company that actually takes care of all of uh, its shareholders and uh, not only its stakeholders. Okay, uh, but uh, uh, also you are obviously facing uh, some challenges in this journey. What are the key challenges, challenges that you experience as an entrepreneur? Is it difficult to motivate the idea generation within your company or some new projects? Um, to be honest with you, uh, to convince the, the board was uh, the, the first challenge, to convince them that this was a good idea to, to create a social business. And then to convince the rest of the colleagues, my, my colleagues and the rest of the executive team and, and try to be a priority in their very busy agendas and try, try to be a priority in their very busy budgets at the same time. So that has been a quite, quite a challenge. Uh, the other one is that when you are an entrepreneur, you don't want to be perceived as the owner of the, of the thing. You want everybody to feel as owners. So it's uh, our thing. And, and that has been quite a challenge again. And, and the other one is competition. We are facing pretty strong competition in, in this part of the world with regular businesses that don't understand that we are a social business, that we have to sell almost at cost and for them is kind of destroying economic value to do so. But it's a, a force, the market is a force that we use to produce good. 
So many challenges that I can talk to. And in addition to that, of course, uh, the high expectations of become uh, to the break even before we, are, we were able. We didn't realize that with those really small prices, it was almost impossible to, to be financially sustainable in a few years. So many, many things, many mistakes that I've been uh, doing so far, things to, to learn from, uh, but a, an, an amazing experience. And even with COVID, uh, the company has been growing even faster because people care about good nutrition now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My comment, uh, uh, which I mentioned previously in discussion with uh, Saskia, what is the role of uh, executives in this scenario? Uh, I would say uh, from from your uh, elaboration that is uh, very important because the commit it, it, commitment from top level is uh, mandatory in order to implement uh, social business initiatives. I will say the most important tool are work on a project that is close to your heart, that is close to your personal purpose. And at the same time, try to find something that is related to the core business of your company and the core can use the core competencies of your company as Saskia was saying. So for me, that's the most important, you need the energy. So it has to be something that you deeply care about and that it's something that is related to the core business, uh, hopefully. And the second one, I will say, uh, think as an entrepreneur, not as an entrepreneur. Like use the forces within the company that you have, financial resources, know-how, et cetera. But think as an entrepreneur, you have to be agile. So you don't have to fit into the, the little corporate box. And the second one that I will feel pretty strong about is you have to feel that you don't have resources, that you don't have a lot of money available, that you have to be really, really efficient, that, that you have to be really, really careful. So that's the mentality of an entrepreneur more than an entrepreneur. And in the beginning, I was thinking about, I'm here with all of these uh, resources, and maybe if I can go back in time, I will feel more and I will try to think more as an entrepreneur using the forces of an entrepreneur. Thank you, Gisela. With your thoughts, I will conclude our conversation. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, all of you for sharing your experience and expertise. Uh, I believe our audience enjoyed enjoy this interesting discussion. We continue with uh, the next session moderated by Flora. It would be all from our session. Best regards for everybody. And as we said, let's change now. Thank you and goodbye. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Hi, bye. Bye. Hi, uh, thank you, Tatiana. Uh, Maywena, maybe you're with us. I don't know. Uh, or maybe we should start uh, talking with Charles, <laughs> who just arrived. Uh, so, Charles, uh, you're uh, you one of the co-founders of the Climate Collage. Uh, five years ago, uh, you had your first uh, daughter and you thought uh, of her growing up in this world. That's what you told me. Uh, so you had your own uh, ego, ego, ecological uh, uh, shock or conscious and uh, quit your job to become a green entrepreneur. Uh, then you met the creator of the climate uh, collage and started to, to train the future trainers. Uh, so now you, three years later, uh, 170,000 uh, players of the collage, right? Uh, and... Um, you created a company to disseminate uh, climate collage, but maybe you should start uh, telling us, maybe uh, some of us don't know what, what, is, is, uh, what is it, so maybe uh, you could uh, explain. Okay, so hello everyone. So the climate collage is very really simple. It's uh, 42 cards that uh, sum up the IPCC report. And it's a workshop. You have to play with uh, a team of seven people. And you have to find the links between causes and consequences. So each cause is like a, a cause or a consequence of the climate change. And at the end of the workshop, you understand the systemic problem of the climate change. And you deeply understand the problem. Because today, I think the, the creator, when he created this game, is called, his name is Cédric Higgenbach. 
um, he was doing some lobbying uh, with um, political leaders and he understood that people don't really understand climate change. We all know about climate change. And recently there was a, um, uh, a, research, a research showing that only 7% of French people really understand climate change and think climate change is only because of human activities, only 7%. That means that, okay, everyone knows about climate change, but we need 100% of French people or 100% of all the human to understand climate change. Mm -hmm. This is what is climate collage. And uh, so you play uh, in companies. Uh, uh, who are the players? Uh, what's players the profile? Can be you, uh, my mom, uh, my boss, uh, my deputy, my MP, uh, whatever. He can play. Uh, we can play the climate collage in jail. Also, you can play the climate collage uh, whatever you want on the, on the beach. Um, it's it's a game um, for um, NGOs, for the society, but also for business and for leaders. Because leaders in business, they need to understand this because it's a strategical question now. And Davos, they all talk about climate change. So uh, your uh, strategy to, to change the world uh, is to uh, play a game and act for the planet at the same time. Exactly. That's original. The, the first step to, uh, to act for climate change or also for biodiversity, it's to understand deeply the problem and then to gather with collectives or with other people to act together, because if you are alone, uh, it can be very, very tough. This subject can be tough and you can go into depression, clearly. So you need to go with other people and to act and to be positive. Okay. Uh, we still don't have uh, news of uh, Maywena, who is supposed to join us. Yeah. Oh, hi, Maywena. I couldn't see you. Hi. So, hi. Maywena, you're uh, the founder of uh, Standard Deviation. Maybe you can uh, tell us a bit more about uh, where you're from, what you did, where you are now, because you're not uh, with us uh, physically. Yeah. Um, so I'm currently in uh, Vermont, in the east coast of the United States. Um, and I'm the co-founder of Standard Deviation. We are a consultancy um, helping business leaders transition their company towards regenerative models. So we help them become solutions in the face of the climate, environmental, and social crisis, rather than just doing less harm. Um, the pen in our name, Standard Deviation, um, comes from this idea of we are, we're helping standard companies, so companies who are part of the mainstream economy, we help them deviate their trajectory. Um, and we help deviants, so companies who today are still marginal in their influence, but have positive impact in their DNA, we help them become the new standard. Um, in both cases, uh, we empower people in those companies um, to come out as business activists. Um, so we help them link their personal, intimate convictions with their business opportunities to transform towards regenerative models. Okay, so um, you work, uh, uh, how do you concretely uh, help companies and do you succeed, succeed with transformation uh, through consulting? Do you think consulting is a, a good way to, uh, to, to change companies yeah. from outside? Um, so it's not uh, what Quentin uh, said about transformation from within. From within, yeah. Um, so... When we started as Standard Deviation, we actually met with a seasoned sustainability uh, educator who told us, after 30 years of teaching sustainability, I finally figured out a way to get people to care about sustainability. And she kind of laid out a, a journey that she used to walk her, you know, the, the people she was working with through. And, and still today, that's something that we use, that recipe, to allow for successful transformation. And the first thing which, you know, um, I think Charles mentioned also is the first step is a common understanding, uh, making sure that you understand the science, the climate crisis, the collapse of biodiversity, the growing social inequalities. It's really about making sure that, you know, you understand how these systems are at a breaking point and what it means for businesses. So sharing the same language is number one um, and is absolutely crucial. The second step is finding a personal rational 
your personal why, what, why would you care? And for some people, it's about, you know, making sure the kids will have a livable planet. For others, it's about making sure that as a business that will continue to thrive and be resilient. Um, for others, it's about, you know, finding a balance in, in their lives and prioritizing living systems, including themselves, rather than just being in, you know, this extractive capitalistic dynamic. Um, so we make sure that people find their own personal reason to be initiating these big, you know, difficult, sometimes daunting challenges. That's number two. Number three, it's about inspiration. Um, and I think that's also where it makes sense, you know, for people from the outside to come in into a company. Um, we show them that it's possible, um, that others are doing it, that companies are transitioning successfully. We um, go and, and find, you know, trailblazers in their sectors. We really show that, yes, it's, it's possible, it works, and it's inspiring. And the last step um, is about understanding how you, at your level, can play your part um, and what the company's way forward is. So it's about laying out, you know, a vision and, and a roadmap um, to get there. It can be quite an emotional journey, to be honest, um, but it's a journey that awakens people um, and, as I said, transforms them into business activists. And even though it's very important that there's within a company a culture that allows for that emotional journey to take place, um, it's usually easier when it's facilitated by someone from the outside. Quentin, uh, have you ever uh, played uh, climate collage uh, as an employee and uh, you're a consultant too uh, uh, in your company? Do you think uh, uh, is sustainability uh, taking more and more uh, space in uh, BCG activities? And do you think uh, consulting in sustainability is, uh, is uh, useful, uh, the impact of it? Uh, thanks. Uh, first, on the Climate College, uh, I did it actually with uh, Charles. It was uh, already two years ago. Uh, and we did, uh, we did it in, in, in indeed uh, as part of uh, the, wo the work of, um, of our employee collective in, uh, in BCG. Uh, and actually, Climate College is one of the key actions that employee collectives uh, in various companies, it's one of the key actions that they are doing. And uh, there are several modalities of these actions. You can uh, do a climate college, you can train people uh, to animate climate college in their company. And this is, this is something that we're trying also to do with employee collectives. And, uh, and there are some um, common values in uh, when you ask, you ask the question, and, uh, can we play a game and at the same time learn on this thing? This is also something that we share in the employee collectives within companies is how we can put pleasure and how we can put joy in the way we address uh, climate change and, uh, and social issues. Uh, so I played, it was a very nice experience uh, that we are now with the employee collectives trying to, um, to scale because indeed it's really important to, uh, to know more and then after knowing that we act. And, uh, and as well for your question on uh, whether consulting should help in that uh, uh, fashion and to help so the, solve the social and uh, ecological challenges. As every company, I mean, consulting as an industry will have to do its transformation like energy companies will have to do so, like mobility companies will have to do so, like fashion companies will have to do so. And what it means for companies is, um, is different. Uh, but at the end, what we, what we say with the Les Collectifs and with Employee Collective is that there are extraordinary people within companies who know the culture of their company, who know the business, and who have this desire to act, and they should be put, they should be more leveraged in order to do this sustainable transformation that consulting has to do and that other industries have to do. So yeah, everybody, we have to, hmm. to do it, but that's right. Uh, Charles, you recently created the Biodiversity Collage. Uh, why, uh, how, uh, uh, can you tell us more about it? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so before, um, you know, three years ago, I didn't know nothing about biodiversity actually. And so I started to spread the climate collage all over uh, France, starting with BCG. And then I did it with, um, with friends who are very passionate about biodiversity. And they told me, Charles, um, uh, biodiversity is as much as important as climate. 
change is, we need to create a game with biodiversity. So uh, we took the IBES report, it's like the IPCC but for biodiversity. They released a very good report in 2019. And we do the sum up to explain what is biodiversity. Because climate change and biodiversity is the same side, the two sides of, sa of the same coin, actually. So we really need to, to tackle these two challenges together. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we, we can maybe reduce or um, uh, solve the climate change problem, but we can create another biodiversity problem. So we need to, really to have these two problems in mind and to have solutions for these two problems. And so the biodiversity co uh, co collage is absolutely the same. It's like with cars, you play with people into uh, digital or in physical, it depends. And it works really, really, really well. And people understand what biodiversity brings to all of us for free. Because we don't understand, but biodiversity is like they give uh, ecosystemic services for free. No one pays for it. And, they re and when they understand this, there is something changing in their mind and they know that we have to carry for biodiversity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I played several times uh, climate uh, collage, but uh, never... Uh, no, but never biodiversity, so I really want to. Uh, I'm going to do it... Uh, <laughs> Uh, as soon as possible. Well, as as possible. <laughs> um, Maïwena, you have a, you're launching a new project too, uh, a re regeneration studio. Maybe you can uh, uh, tell us more about it. Sure. Yeah. So we're launching um, a regeneration studio to help businesses launch new ventures that are truly regenerative. And by regenerative, we mean um, three things: one, that a business is actually able to capture more carbon than they emit. Um, two, is building back biodiversity rather than destroying it. And three, is actively building social justice rather than contributing to the widening inequality gap. Um, and to build this you know, regenerative economy that will allow us to thrive in, in, the, in the next decades to come, um, we're lucky to have a few trailblazer companies, um, you know, the Patagonias, the Dr. Bronners of the world who are exploring this in, in a super serious way, but there's still, there's still so much to invent, right? So how do you source ingredients and materials that contribute to ecosystem regeneration? How do you build um, supply chains around regeneration? How do you operate a culture as an organization that allows for regeneration? And how do you communicate and engage consumers um, in that shift? So to answer all these questions, um, we're building an environment that allows entrepreneurs to explore these issues um, with the help of experts, you know, farmers, biolo biologists, uh, marketers, um, you know, people from the finance sector, et cetera. So the goal is really to try to train entrepreneurs so that they can become more ecosystem centric and leverage their audacity, their creativity, their ingenuity to benefit ecosystem and community health. Um, so we're starting with the first cohort this summer um, with companies in different industries, wine, textile, uh, cosmetics, etc. So uh, to uh, Maywena uh, and Charles, uh, you're both uh, entrepreneurs. Um, do you think uh, if uh, employees are feeling uh, ecological uh, anxiety or, or worse, ecological depression, uh, the best way uh, is to quit their initial job as you, you did, uh, Charles, uh, or uh, they can act uh, from within? I know there is not like one path, uh, one magical path, and then you change the world, of course not. Uh, but uh, do you think, uh, uh, where do you think uh, we can uh, be more uh, efficient uh, and uh, and um, what are your maybe your tips uh, for uh, maybe people watching uh, uh, and want want to initiate a change um, I think that you, when you are in, working in a big company or in a company whatever you are um, I think the best thing to do is to stay <laughs> um, and then to think what you can do inside this company uh, there are so many things to, to do inside your company first before leaving to, uh, to become a farmer. Mm. Um, first, you can understand the problem and spread maybe the climate collage, the biodiversity collage through the colleagues, through whatever you want, through all the company. So that's a good, a good, good step. Mm. Second thing, you need to, to create or to join a collective, uh, to gather with other people to make some collective actions. 
and you will see that you, you give a signal to the leaders in your, into your company and they, are, they will integrate this signal one day. And then um, I think you need to, to try to, um, to change the core business of your business. Because uh, the core business is the key. So if you are in a company, go into the core business and try to change this core business, to change the business model. And when you will hopefully uh, reach the change of the business model, and after you will have to go to the, maybe to the political leaders to change the rule, because the rule has to change. And, but the rule will change when the business model will prove that there is a way, mm -hmm. and when people will show that they want to change. So it's all this um, journey that you have to, to, to live, and if there are some hurdles or problems or whatever, Maybe you can think about leaving the company, but if you leave the company, say why <laughs> and say it loudly. <laughs> so the leaders yeah. into your company understand why there is a problem. Yeah, that's a really good uh, advice indeed. Uh, Maywena, do you often meet uh, clients uh, ready to change uh, their core business? Or yes, actually we do. Well, it doesn't, you know, they don't come to us with that question, but in the end, that's what, um, that's oftentimes the outcome of our projects for sure. Um, and I, t I very much agree with what Charles um, just said. There's, you know, I think a good question um, to ask yourself of, you know, if you're in that position of should I stay or should I leave, um, there's this question of what's your responsibility in the literal sense, like what's your ability to respond? Um, and if your thing is, you know, become a farmer, then great, do that. You know, we need more farmers. But if you're happy in the corporate world um, and your best ability to respond is by being a financial director or a, a project manager or an executive assistant or, you know, a marketer, then, then do that. Um, we need, of course, these talents to um, be working on, on a transition um, and, and we need these people from within the companies. Um, you, you know, when you start looking at system thinking and, and systems like, you know, permaculture, for example, what's super inspiring is that every species has a role to play and no one else has your role to play. So it's really about asking yourself, what is my best ability to respond? What is my role? I think in, in the panel earlier on, uh, Gisela, she was mentioning this notion of purpose and what was the thing that she was the most drawn to that also was intersecting with the need that is outside in the world. And so it's, I, I think it's really about um, making sure that you ask yourself that question. Yeah. Uh, Quentin, uh, do you think when we are not uh, CEO or top leaders, uh, top management, uh, we can like really transform uh, organization, this idea of a, a core business, uh, uh, trans transforming core business? Do you think it's possible when we are not high? Yeah. In, uh, among employee collectives, what we often say is that we're not trying to ask the question of is it possible or can I have an impact? It's really more... What can I do with the people around me? What can I really concretely do tomorrow? Um, and what we saw in the experiences of the, for instance, the, the dozens of uh, employee collectives that we gathered is that when you start with these small actions and gathering a few colleagues, then it, it starts to be bigger. And we have experiences of collectives who then had great discussions and great co-building projects with their management to have this discussion on the, on the business model. So, the question is, uh, we all can have an, an impact, uh, and the question is more how we scale it and how we go faster to have a greater impact. And, and this is why um, in the last months we connected uh, several employee collectives, and now we created this network of employee collectives because we feel that there is a, we can scale up now. Uh, we can scale up because uh, there are many people within companies who have this desire to act, so we want to help them to act. Initiating a collectives on, and trying to transform it into how they can make evolve the, the core business. And there is also a scale up in, indeed, if you look at the actions of the collective, the true potential that we see is how we leverage this extraordinary force of people wanting to act to change the core business of companies. And it's very important to be exemplary and to align its own um, behaviors with, uh, with, with our own personal con con convictions. But really, the leverage effect 
is in the products and the services of companies, and there are many people within companies who are highly aware of these topics and who have ideas and who are ready to act to change it. Yeah. Uh, Without being CEOs. Yeah. Uh, to conclude uh, briefly, uh, maybe Maywena or, or, or Charles, uh, um, uh, do you think we can uh, deeply uh, conduct ecological changes uh, in companies, in big corporations, because that's what we are talking about, uh, without changing social uh, vision, uh, culture uh, in, in these companies? Uh, or do you think these two changes... Um, Uh, have to go like together or do you think we can like really change without changing the social uh, system uh, how it works uh, I, I I won't say changing capitalism but almost who want to start uh, let's uh, my winner. well actually there's I think there's something really fascinating when you look at companies who have very um, serious and interesting environmental practices or sustainability strategies is that these companies also often have a culture that allows for people empowerment. And it's those two things go together because when you have people who are grounded, who are empowered, who have agency, who are free to speak their minds, um, who are free to be themselves, then you have people who, who care. And you have people who care about what they do, about how it impacts um, you know, their neighbors, their communities. So it's when you start having this connection that you have destruction, right? It's when you have this connection between people who make decisions and people who do the work, when you have this connection between you know, the physical location of where you make those decisions and where the work is happening, that's when you have destruction. So it's fascinating to see that great sustainability transformation always or oftentimes really goes hand in hand with, with a strong people empowerment culture. Um, and that's also when we see the rise of, you know, models that exist within capitalism, but are not necessarily capitalistic, like co-ops, for example. So when you look at co-ops and, and, and that power being distributed among people and still operating as a business, but operating in a very much, you know, horizontal way, um, you also see a, a, a much, you know, more fertile ground for sustainability practice. Um, yeah. Yeah, Sean? I would say two things. Uh, first thing is that the rules has to change for the business because if the rules don't change, some people will, some pioneer will do it and the other one don't do it. So the game is not uh, fair. But for the, if we want the rule to change, we need to get some buy-in from a lot of people. That's why the climate collage or the biodiversity collage is useful because we need, need a lot of people embark into this transition. First, first idea. The second idea is that um, we're always talking about uh, technological energy transition, but it's more a cultural transition. It's all the solutions are here. If we want to do it, we just need to we just do it. But our system, our economic system, our cultural system, our political system, it has to be has to change. So it's very cultural. So of course, if we want uh, companies to change, we need a very cultural move to a new thing to invent. It's not invented yet, I think. We need to invent it. And that's a big, big, big challenge because culture, it's a long way to change people's mind. Mm -mm. But it's a very good challenge. Yeah. Thanks to book or theater or videos or um, series, many things to do. Yeah. Uh, okay, I just see time is up. So thank you, uh, uh, everyone, uh, for this discussion. And I hope uh, all uh, employees uh, watching uh, us today are going to, to change initiate uh, changes because we can all uh, do it to change now. We That's a conclusion. <laughs> thank you, Flora. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, yeah, go for it. Bye. Thanks, Rochelle.